Hello, welcome to mini lecture two for probability and statistics. The last mini lecture looked at our process for collecting some data and some initial ways of representing the characteristics of that data with median values, interquartile range and so on. But we know that there's um, a population that we want to be representing uh, from the sample that we've measured. And so one way of doing that is to make some assumptions about the nature of that population and then apply a model to our measured data to um, try and get an estimate for what the population is. So this lecture, first of all, we'll look at histograms for visualization, standardization and analysis. These will enable us to compare the data from one experiment to another experiment in a more generic way. And then secondly, we'll look at how the normal distribution can be fitted to uh, a set of data um, and uh, some of the subtleties um, of a normal distribution that you might not have encountered before. Here is the mathematician Gauss and it was about 225 years ago that he said he started to first use the distribution that is known as the normal distribution or the Gaussian distribution or the bell curve it goes by different names and it's of central importance to all of our work in probability and or analysis of experimental data. In his case, he was analysing the motion of the planets and trying to take account of the errors that were inherent in the measurements they were taking, um, trying to uh, come up with uh, an understanding of gravity and planetary motion. For us, we're looking at our metal sample, trying to come up with uh, a picture of what the actual metal characteristics are going to be in general. So not just the particular measurements we took, but actually what's this likely to be like in general so that we can predict what would happen with future samples. And the starting point for that is to take the data that we got from our particular set of experiments and start to represent it in a more general way. And we're going to do that by creating a histogram. And that means we process our data and put it into a more systematic form. And we do that by identifying intervals, and each interval has, um, uh, we call it interval i, uh, and each interval has a width, w, and then we count how many data values sit within that interval. So we have ni data values within each interval, uh, and each interval will have a midpoint x. So we do that. So we create a set of intervals. We get to choose the span of the intervals from the bottom to the top. Uh, we get to choose how many they are there are. We get to choose whether they're all the same size or they could be different sizes. To begin with we'll just keep them the same size. And this will start to generalize, generalize the data that we have. We're interested in a few terms. The frequency, so that's the number of times one of our measured data points lies within a particular interval. Obviously that depends on how many experiments we do. So we have the relative frequency, where we take the frequency and divide it by the total number of experiments or the total number of measurements. Uh, and this will make it a more general term, which is less dependent on the number of experiments you do. Density, what does that mean? Well, obviously, the frequency will depend on how wide the category width is, the interval width is. The wider the width, the more chance there is of a particular measurement falling within it. So the relative frequency is helpful but it doesn't tell the whole story. The frequency density is the frequency divided by the width of the interval. So therefore the wider the interval the lower the density would be for the same number of values. And then of course these two things can be combined together to come up with the relative frequency density. And this takes account of both aspects. It takes account of the fact that it depends on how many experiments we've done and it depends on how wide our interval is. And so the relative frequency density, rho rel x, is equal to the number of samples within our interval divided by the interval width and the total number of samples measured. And so this now is a nice generic parameter that removes some of the 
uh, arbitrary aspect of our particular experiment, uh, the interval width and the number of times we did it, uh, to come up with a parameter which should start to become consistent from one experiment to the next experiment. So let's do that for our data set. This is our data that we've seen already, ordered from smallest to largest. The range was 210 megapascals, so that's the range from the smallest to the largest value. So we need to pick some intervals to start with, uh, and we need to come up with a sensible number of interv intervals and a sensible width. So with uh, a range of 210, we want to make sure we capture all the intervals. Uh, we've only got 14 data points, so there's no point in having too many intervals. So let's try five intervals then we might expect to get about three measurements on average per interval so you can't go much lower than that so we'll try five intervals and so if we have five intervals of 50 megapascals then we can get that to nicely span the total range so we create a table where we have our interval we have the midpoint of the interval and the width of the interval. And then we're going to count the frequency, how many times we have a data point within that interval. And then we're going to calculate the relative frequency density from that. So these are all of our intervals starting at 745. And then we add 50 each time to give us the interval. This time we've carefully selected the intervals so that 745 to 795, since our data is only to two significant figures, we're never going to get a data point that's lying on the boundary between the intervals. If a data point does lie on the boundary between intervals, that's fine. You just have to come up with a decision about whether it's going to lie in the upper or the lower interval and to be consistent about that. So we've got each of our intervals. We've got the midpoint of the interval. The interval width is consistent and it's 50 all the way along. And then we've counted. So from 745 to 795, we take a look through it it's in order, so it's easy to see. There's just one, 780 lies in that interval. So we have frequency equals one. And what we want to find is the relative frequency density. So that's the frequency one divided by the width, 50, divided by n, the number of samples. And then we get 0.0014. What's the units of this? Well, frequency doesn't have a unit. The width is in megapascals. n, the number of samples, that doesn't have a unit. So it must be equal to megapascals to the minus one is our unit. We do that for all of the ranges and we come up with our relative frequency density for each range. And then that's something that we can plot. Here I am doing it by hand. In normal times we'd be asking you to do exams on pen and paper with pen and paper um, and so we'd expect you to be able to sketch a histogram in conditions like that. You could use graph paper if you want to, um, but you don't even need to do that to come up with a reasonable visualization of the data. Just use a ruler, pick some axes, and you can sketch it out pretty quickly. So we can see each of our intervals, 745 to 795, nicely match the scale that we selected for the graph. And then I'm using the ruler just to uh, represent each of those relative frequency densities. So you can see the axis for the y-axis is rho rel, that means the relative frequency density. And you can see I've written the units in of megapascals to the minus one. And of course, the x-axis is strength in megapascals. And there we go, that's our analysed data. This is what we call a histogram. You would have plotted histograms before. Um, there are lots of questions in the question tutorial uh, giving you practice to plot histograms. I recommend you do them, and you'll find that the examples that we give have uh, increasing amounts of subtlety in them about how you should go about um, picking the ranges uh, and selecting uh, or working out what you do at boundaries when data points lie on boundaries and so on. What we've done is we've taken a list of numbers and turned it into something we can see, and that's really helpful when analysing data. We can see straight away that the data follows a pattern where there is a peak and it decays away at either side. And our choice of 
interval number and width looks to be pretty good. Uh, we couldn't have had many more intervals than that, um, but we've got enough that we get a picture which looks fairly smooth and uh, we're hoping that this is starting to become representative of what the general material is like and not just what our particular sample was. This of course gives us something that can be compared from one experiment to another. This is no longer dependent on the number of data points we took um, and it uh, can be repeated and you can compare one histogram to another histogram and they're di directly comparable so you can see how similar or how different they are. We can start to use it to do something useful with it. We've got some information now in a form that we can use to make simple engineering decisions. For example, what's the chance of a steel sample failing below 820 megapascals? Well, here we've got a distribution, the relative frequency distribution. And because it's been normalized, we divided by n, the area under this distribution equals one. So if you want to find out the probability of it being uh, of a sample say failing below 820 we can find 820 on our axis and say okay well the area to the left of that will tell us the likelihood of a sample failing based on the data we have so you take that point and then you can calculate measure the area to the left of it and this will give us uh, an indication of the likelihood of a sample failing based on our set of measurements and so here it comes out at 0.079. So it's about 8% chance of a sample failing below 820 megapascals. That's really helpful. You can start to make an engineering decision based on that. Is that an acceptable risk or is it unacceptable? And if you carry on, if you integrate over the whole area for the relative frequency density, it will always be equal to one. If you're plotting the frequency Uh, so if you're plotting the um, just the density, then it uh, won't be equal to 1. It will be equal to the number of samples you've taken. It's the fact that it's relative that's important. Uh, by dividing by the total number of samples, it means that the area under this plot is always equal to 1. OK, there's our plot plotted using Excel. I did this in Excel, and you'll find that Excel is not very good for plotting histograms. You can plot a bar chart in Excel as a default option, but please notice that a bar chart is not the same as a histogram. And in particular, the bar chart doesn't have, it likes to have discrete entities on the x-axis. So it has cats and dogs and fish. Uh, it doesn't have a continuous scale and it doesn't facilitate you determining the width of each um, bar. Uh, for a histogram, it's very important what the width of each of these is because we divided by the width to get our relative frequency density. Uh, so the density word is the one that represents that we've divided by the width. So this one I've done, but I did it by calculating each of these points separately and then getting Excel to plot the lines one by one, plot, 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 plot again, plot again, and so on. So it's a little bit laborious. Um, uh, to give us this picture. So doing it by hand is indeed a, a, a quicker way of doing it than using Excel in this instance. But I've done this because I want to show you the effect of some of the decisions we made before. We chose five categories, five intervals, each of 50, but we had a choice there, we didn't have to. So how would it look different if we changed that? So here we are with three intervals. So three intervals of 100 megapascals. It's the same data, we've just analyzed it using a different choice of interval. You can see it obviously looks similar, but it's quite different. It uh, doesn't give you such a good picture of what the spread of the data looks like. You can see that there's a, a peak here, but uh, you don't get much impression of what the shape looks like. So in this case, we've lost some information. We've lost probably too much information. There's useful information within the data that um, we've uh, got rid of by not picking enough intervals. Here, we've got nine intervals of 25 megapascals. So the more intervals you have, obviously the less data, you're, less information you're losing as you categorize it for the histogram. But here, you can see that uh, it's probably too many intervals because we don't have a very smooth uh, 
picture of what's happening. We've got a region where there are no samples. So obviously the data is the data, that's what we measured, but we're trying to create a picture of what the actual population would look like that the data we've sampled has come from. So we're not interested in exactly what is our data, we're interested in what's the population going to be like that our data came from. And by picking a suitable interval width and number, uh, that's what it's starting to do. It's starting to turn our data into something that probably looks like what the actual population looks like that it came from. So that's where we were, that's what we had. We've got this idea of the population that the data came from. How can we work out what that is? And this is where the mathematician Gauss came in. He developed an idea of the central limit theorem. Uh, we're going to talk more about this in the course later on, and you've probably encountered it in your A-level maths already. But essentially it leads to the idea that if you have a set of data where it's been subject to random events, random variables, um, where lots of random variables are happening and they're being added together, the overall effect is to create this normal distribution. You'd have encountered normal distributions, they look like this. And so it is very often the case that when you take a set of data, of measured data, where you're trying to measure something that is, uh, in principle, it's one value, but random errors are influencing it, you'll find that the data looks like this shape, looks like the normal distribution. So this is our first model we're going to use. We're going to postulate that the data comes from a population that is normally distributed um, and therefore when we've added our own errors as well, the random errors of our experiment and so on, that uh, our data will still be normally distributed. So we can take our data, the histogram, and we can fit the normal distribution to it and then that will tell us, specifically it will tell us what the normal distribution is of our data and then we can hope or we can think about will that will those parameters represent the population that we're actually trying to get the population of all the steel samples in the world so how do we do that what does it mean to fit the normal distribution first of all we fit the mean you know this you have done this already you've seen these terms the mean and the variance and standard deviation the mean and the variance define the normal distribution and you know the definition of the mean it's where you add up all of your values and divide it by the total number of values that's the mean so this is a bit like the median before we're finding a middle value but this one was developed specifically to uh, account for or to match with the normal distribution so we do that in our case add them all up divide by 14 and we get 873 megapascals then we want to find the standard deviation. The standard deviation is the square root, so S is the standard deviation, uh, but that's a square root term. So we often use the variance, which is the squared of the standard deviation because it's more convenient to use. The variance, you take the mean and you take each of your data points, subtract one from the other, square it and add them up. And then you divide by, divide by the number of data points. Now you'll notice that's different here. We're dividing here by the number of data points minus one. We'll see why in a moment, but we call this the non-biased standard deviation. In this case that works out at 2514 megapascals. Sorry, the variance is 2514 megapascals squared and the standard deviation will be the square root of that. 50.1. So that was the non-biased standard deviation. What you have probably seen before is the biased standard deviation, Sn. So the subscript is telling us which one we've got. The biased is where we divide by n, total number of data points. Non-biased, n minus 1, is where we divide by n minus 1. Obviously the two things are related by that ratio, n minus 1 divided by n. that comes out at a slightly different value. The bias standard deviation is 48.3, so it's a little bit less than the non bias standard deviation. So you need to, first of all, appreciate that there are two 
definitions here of standard deviation that we can use and you have to decide which one you think is appropriate for an instance. Before we go on, we've got a nice result that I will just highlight. This was the definition for the biased standard deviation or the biased variance. And we want to look at this term and think, uh, is there a form that we can express this in that is somewhat, sometimes easier? Uh, the results down here already, so we're just going to see how you get there. So it's a little bit of practice of using the summation notation and doing a little bit of algebra using that. So first of all, let's expand this squared term. So we get xj squared minus 2xj x bar plus x bar squared. You'll know about that. And then with the summation terms, we can separate it out. So we have a summation of each of these terms. 1 over n xj squared, sum all those terms. Here we can take out the constants, so we have the minus 2 and we have the x bar there constants divided by the n, and so we're just summing xj, this term. And then finally we have x bar squared, x bar squared is a constant, and so we sum that n times, and so we have n times x bar squared divided by the original n. We can then simplify that, the first term stays the same, the second term we note that the sum of xj divided by n is indeed the mean itself. So this is actually 2 times the mean times the mean. So 2 times x bar squared, n divided by n is 1, so that's x bar squared. Obviously these are the same thing, so we can take one away from the other, and then we get our result. So we have 1 over n, sum of xj squared minus x bar squared. And then we notice this, well, the sum of xj squared that uh, divided by n, that's equal to the mean of xj squared. So the result is that the variance is equal to the mean of the squared of j minus the square of the mean of x. I think I just said that wrong. The square, uh, the mean of the square of x minus the square of the mean of x is what I'm saying. Okay, so we are doing stuff that you're familiar with. You've done this before, I'm sure. Um, and I know that you probably have also thought about populations and samples. So that's what we're trying to think about here. So I'm going to give you an example just so that we can see what's going on. Uh, this is um, a representation of a population. So I've just plotted this in Excel. I've taken a normally distributed population which has a mean of 5 and a standard deviation of 2. Okay, and I've represented that here. That point is the mean and that's the standard deviation, one standard deviation either side. And then I've created some data sets from that population. <clears throat> so that's like our experiment. This is representing what the average properties of all the steel in the world is. And then we're taking 14 samples each time or however many samples and looking at our particular measurements. And we can look at our measurements and we can look at how they compare to the overall population that they came from. So here's our first example. This is our random data. We've got six data points here. And then what we're doing each time was we're finding our own mean and our own standard deviation from that data. So this is the mean calculated from the sample that we've taken and this shows the standard deviation, one standard deviation either side from the sample that we've taken. So it's reinforcing the idea that there's the population and there's the sample. And we're taking samples because we want to learn about the population. So when we're calculating the standard deviation of the sample, we're not actually interested necessarily in the standard deviation of our particular sample. What we're interested in is well, actually what's the standard deviation of the population it came from. So we note there are two different things there. Here's the non-biased standard deviation. It's a little bit bigger than SN. It's a little bit bigger than the biased one. Obviously, they look pretty similar in this case. And then this can be repeated. These are random samples taken. And each time we're calculating the mean. And each time we're calculating both the biased and the non-biased standard deviation. And we're just plotting those each time. So individually, when we look at them, it's hard to tell 
whether one is better than the other, whether the biased or the non-biased standard deviation is giving us a better indication of the population than the other. It's apparent that quite often they're different from the popula population they came from. So obviously with only six data points, there's uh, the potential for quite large discrepancies between the two. But let's have a look at this. This is showing the mean standard deviation against the number of data sets. What does that mean? Okay, so we're taking this population and we're taking samples from it. So if I take one sample from it, we'd have one estimate of the standard deviation of the population. If I take two samples from it, we'll have two estimates of the standard deviation of the sample of the population. Uh, and so on. If we take five data sets, if we take five samples, we'll have five estimates of the standard deviation of the population. And so if we have five estimates of the standard deviation of the population, let's take the mean of those. And as we progress, as we take more and more data sets, you might expect that the mean of the standard deviations from each sample you've taken, you might expect that, that will in the end come to be the same as the standard deviation of the population that they came from. But what you see is that's not actually what happens. This is the biased standard deviation. And we see as we take more and more data sets, there's a offset. It never tends towards the actual standard deviation of the population. That's why it's called biased. There's an inherent problem with the mathematics of what we're doing, which leads it to be always a bit too small. Uh, we're not going to go into the exact reasons why, just to note that that's what happens. Um, and then we can see why we also calculate the non-biased standard deviation, because the non-biased does indeed start to tend towards the value we want. So we want, in this case, we want to estimate the standard deviation of the population. And that you can see that as the more and more samples you take, the non-biased standard deviation does start to become a better and better approximation of this. So it's not to say that one's wrong and one's right, they're different things. The biased one, that does tell us the standard deviation of the sample. And if that's what you want to know, that's what you should use. But if you're using that sample to try and work out what the standard deviation of the population is that the sample came from, then you should be using the non-biased case. So that brings the second lecture to a conclusion. We've looked at how we can use histograms to take a specific set of data, a single sample from a population, and how we can visualize that in a more generic way to enable comparison between one data set and another data set and to allow standardization and analysis. We also use that to do a little bit of analysis. Secondly, we saw how the normal distribution model can be applied. Uh, we looked a little bit at the assumptions of that and in cases where we expect random errors, we might expect our sample to look like that or two, and then we can use the sample to calculate a mean and standard deviation, and then consider whether they're going to be representative of the mean and standard deviation of the population that our sample came from. And we saw that the non-biased variance gives a better estimate of the population variance than the biased case. The next mini lecture is going to start to look at the application of some of these ideas in practice with errors in experiments. We're going to look at random and systemic errors, significant figures, accuracy and precision, dealing with errors in labs, and the accuracy of the mean. Thank you very much. See you in the next lecture.